All right, so uh, next up we have uh, Richard Myers from uh, Gotenna, and he'll be going into a little bit of mesh network incentivization through layer two. Let's give one hand, yeah. another hand of applause to uh, Richard Myers. Woo. So, hi everyone, I'm uh, Richard Myers. I'm an applications engineer at Gotenna. Uh, Gotenna is a mobile mesh networking company that's building next generation. Sorry, is it? Testing, testing, is that better? Yeah, okay, so, um, so Gotenna is, uh, like I said, they're a mobile mesh networking company building next generation devices and protocols for completely decentralized communication. And uh, today I just want to bring by you guys some ideas that we're, we're looking for feedback from the academic and uh, you know, Bitcoin community um, on, on what we're working on. So this, this is a Gotenna. Um, Gotenna Mesh powers the world's first consumer mobile mesh network. Uh, it's focused on sending short data <clears throat> over long distances using a uh, completely decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, it doesn't, uh, the decentralized network, by that I mean it doesn't need Wi-Fi, mobile data, or satellite to communicate. So using a, a mesh is, uh, sending messages is free, and it allows you to send messages over a completely end-to-end -end encrypted communication channel using the UHF spectrum which is a public UHF spectrum, which is also called the ISM band. Uh, it's as easy to use as your just normal uh, instant messaging program, but it, it uses a peer-to-peer -peer transport layer that works even when nothing else will. Uh, the founder of Gotenna was um, partially inspired to start the company because of her experience uh, in 2012 uh, when uh, Hurricane Sandy hit New York. Um, so that's, that's sort of the motivation here. So how does a mobile mesh network work? So um, the device, if it, when it communicates to a destination within range, it com communicates directly. But if the destination is further away, it's going to hop from device to device to device until it reaches the destination. Um, so what this does is this transforms density into capacity. And um, this all happens automatically using the Aspen Grove protocol, which um, which is, allows these, these messages to, to route through the network. Um, and what it essentially is doing is it's turning your cell phone into a low cost, low power um, infrastructure for a bottom up people powered network versus a centralized uh, network. So that is very similar to the Bitcoin um, peer to peer network. So this is a map of, of Bitcoin nodes. And you'll notice, you know, if you know the, the Bitcoin peer to peer network is also flat. It doesn't have a special nodes or centralized coordinators to, to make the P2P network um, work to route. And that's also true for the Lightning network. It's also a flat network without any cent central uh, organizers. But unfortunately, these peer to peer networks, Bitcoin peer to peer networks, um, are implemented on a physical internet, which is actually um, dependent on centralized ISPs and mobile carriers uh, to work. Even sending an instant message from uh, my phone to a phone a few feet away is going to require data to transfer to some base station, you don't know where, to, to a server um, to, to make it work. And, and that's despite the fact that your phone is actually capable of building mesh networks, technically. Um, but the, the um, licensees of the spectrum, your mobile licensees, they don't actually have any in, in economic incentive to allow you to communicate in that meshed fashion. At best, you can use a Bluetooth, which has very limited range and really isn't enough to create a practical mesh network. So the problem with running a peer-to-peer um, -peer overlay network on centralized hardware is you have problems like censorship. Um, obviously, you also have um, surveillance, domestic surveillance. We've got good reports on that. Um, and also just infrastructure failure generally. And you might be thinking of uh, Puerto Rico and uh, Hurricane Maria that took out 97% of the island's communication infrastructure. But this is also true for more highly connected places like here in Boston and New York. Um, so centralized infrastructure is just inherently fragile. 
not resilient. Um, fortunately, there are um, solutions appearing uh, that are coming out. So we've got satellites, uh, local mesh networks like Gotenna, also long range um, radio. And this isn't just for Bitcoin transactions, but for just communication in general. Uh, last year, we announced a project with, um, where we were collaborating with the Samurai Wallet team to create TX Tenna. And what that allows you to do is send a Bitcoin, signed Bitcoin transaction over the mesh network from a phone um, without any sort of internet connection. Blockstream is also has some um, interesting developments coming out where they have a, uh, an API that allows anybody to send random data anywhere on Earth through their satellite system and pay for it with uh, lightning micropayments. Recently, um, Rodolfo Novak from CoinKite also uh, demonstrated using sending data, sending Bitcoin transaction uh, information over a high-frequency radio, long-distance high-frequency radio link. Um, so this is also an idea that was, um, was discussed by uh, Elaine Au and, and Nick Zabo back in 2017 at the Breaking Bitcoin conference. And in this uh, particular demonstration, he sends a lightning invoice over a 20-meter uh, uh, yeah, amateur radio band from Toronto all the way to Elaine Au, who's in San Francisco. So it's pretty cool stuff. Um, central mobile carriers, they, um, they very carefully plan where they're going to put their base stations so that when you um, fire up your cell phone, you have uh, somebody to talk to. This is also true for mesh networks. You want to make sure that there's a receiver within range when you, when you want to send some data and that there's a communication pack, path between people who want to communicate. So this is the basic problem is how do we create a decentralized network with high coverage and delivery success? but without introducing um, centralized planning or centralized control or, and centralized control. So one way to do that is for the sender, for who is ever sending the data, to just pay the individual relays um, that are carrying the data to the destination. Um, this creates an incentive for people to operate their, their radios, or operate as nodes in the mesh, where and when they're most needed. Um, you could use traditional payment systems for this, PayPal, what have you. Um, but obviously that sort of defeats the purpose to use a centralized payment system to pay for a decentralized um, communication network. Because it would just reintroduce the centralization problems that we talked about earlier. So what Blockstream has done with Lightning micropayments, it suggests a, perhaps a better way to go about doing this. Um, but before we talk about lightning, I just want to talk about a, a simpler approach, which, which is a good place to start. So imagine an on-chain transaction where the sender of the data has outputs, has a, just a normal on-chain Bitcoin transaction where each output goes to one of these relays that relays the data. Um, what's good about that is it satisfies most of what we would want in a, in a mesh incentivization system. So each relay can check that it's included in the payment. It can look at the output, see if it's there. Um, no relay can be excluded from the payment because it's part of one transaction that's signed together. Relays are paid only if the data is delivered. You could do something like with a pre-image hash. Um, and the payments can be settled without interacting back to the, to the sender. So yeah, you've got some basic, basically what you need. But that also means that every message that gets sent ends up resulting in an on-chain Bitcoin transaction. Um, that's not so good. We, we fought that fork war in 2017 about some of these issues. Um, and it has to be confirmed on the network. So you need, need to have an internet gateway for each message you send. Um, but what's really bad is that the relay nodes are not online. They don't have internet connectivity. So they're not going to know when they see a Bitcoin transaction whether that input is actually valid or whether it's been double spent or just completely invalid. Um, so that's probably not a real good way to, to go forward. So if you think about the Lightning Network, people are already looking at sending um, message blobs along with payments. Uh, I think the EOB, it's uh, encrypted onion blobs. I think that's what it stands for. Um, so, so, there's, so it's actually a nice analogy where each relay can get some sort of incentive payment just like, like normal lightning payments operate now. 
Um, the cool thing about this is now you don't need to do an on-chain um, verification of every relay because you're in a two of two multi-sig transaction with each of your peers. So you don't need to, to actually go and um, verify that on the blockchain and you can trust that it's valid. Um, and you do have to still verify your, your, your two transactions, your setting up of the channel and your, perhaps your closing of the channel, but um, it's much better than our single transaction per payment would be. Um, but there's some bad things. Um, for one thing, you're negotiating with each channel as you go. So the overall data that you're broadcasting on the network, um, and th these aren't you know, high like streaming video level um, devices. So you have to be conservative with the data that you broadcast. And when you're negotiating each update channel, that um, is gonna be larger than you would have had with just a single transaction sent over the network. Um, and, um, and you still do need to update you know, yeah. And there's still some on-chain transactions, so you still need to be aware of that. Um, but, but probably the, you know, a worse thing is that part of the security model of Lightning, if it's using watchtowers to confirm that, that your channels aren't, um, uh, invalid channel states aren't, aren't broadcast, requires that you're sending, um, you're sending information through an internet gateway to basically get it to those watchtowers. And if you have to do that for every single message you send, well, now your security model is gonna become dependent on your ability to have access through a gateway to the internet. Um, so it's not ideal. You know, There may be other ways to, to solve that, but that, that's not ideal. Um, <clears throat> so what, um, yeah, what I'd really love to tell you now about a project we're working on that tries to address some of these questions and, um, and problems. And this, uh, we gave it the code name Lot49, which is based on the Thomas Pynchon novel. And in this novel, he describes a um, mysterious underground postal delivery service. So we found that was a pretty good name. So what do we do in Lot49? So, this is basically an optimized version of, lot of, uh, sorry, of Lightning Network, where we're trying to optimize to decrease the amount of broadcast incentive data um, that's necessary to make these sort of payments to your relays. And we, we use some of these technologies that have been proposed to decrease on-chain transaction sizes and, and decrease block sizes, but instead try to use them in a way that decreases the amount of data that's actually broadcast um, between nodes and also broadcast through gateways um, to the internet. So the good thing about this is that um, we can really aggressively um, optimize our protocol. Um, for this one task of reducing the transmission size. So we can use a lot of um, inference, things that you wouldn't do on the internet because you've got plenty of bandwidth. We can actually put that into our gossip protocol to really reduce the overhead of, of what's broadcast relative to the data that actually is delivered. And some things, I know Ted is, uh, uh, Christian is here hopefully, uh, channel factories, things like that that, are, that you know, have been proposed for block reduction can be used in other ways too for our off-grid mesh. Um, but some of the bad things are that although a lot of the techniques we're looking at are um, being discussed in the, in the Bitcoin community and, and some of them are likely to end up in the protocol, uh, some of them aren't. We have been looking at BLS signatures, if anybody um, is familiar with that. And it's a cool technology, but it's not too likely to end up in Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, there's a risk that some of what we want to do may not be possible on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and even given things that are included, it's always risky to use some of these new technologies. And so there's certainly a lot of um, consideration that has to go into how we use these schemes uh, to make sure we don't introduce sort of different security uh, assumptions. Um, but yeah, but uh, actually I skipped ahead to the ugly part, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we're, we're also inferring uh, a lot of information and that, that can cause coordination issues in the network. Um, but, but it's mostly the fact that we require some of these soft fork things to happen. Um, that's the real, that's the real um, blocker perhaps on some of these things. Um, to try to get our head around this, we have, uh, and to refine these ideas, we've created some, I've created some uh, high level, um, some high level simulations, sort of general overview simulations 
primarily focused on how much data is actually transmitted relative to delivery data. So this is a, this picture here is just an example of we have nodes moving around, they're moving at a certain speed, um, there's a certain number of gateways, uh, things like that. Um, and the results of that are, um, yeah, so you've got, as, uh, as you go down this list here, you're looking at increasing densities of nodes in this mesh network in our simulations. And what happens is you get to a certain density, most interactions are no more than two hops away. Um, so in this example, we were looking at sending 200 bytes per, per packet. So a total of 400 bytes is sent if you're not doing any incentivization at all. But if you include the incentivization, it sort of trends towards around 400 bytes of additional data that you've got to send to get these incentive, uh, incentive messages passed to the right place. Um, so yeah, and th if you increase your payload size, you can amortize some of this cost over uh, more data. But the 400 should be roughly you know, fixed. You know, with different assumptions, it might be higher or lower. Now, it's a short talk. I can't go into every um, possible problem that we've run into, but I can say that all the techniques we've looked at, there's always a lot of um, subtle issues to be, to be analyzed. Um, some that, that might come to mind for people who are familiar with these problems are, like there's a fair exchange problem at the end. So when you want to deliver the data to the destination, we're expecting the destination to sign for that data to acknowledge that they received it. Um, and that's a classic fair exchange problem. And we don't really have a potential solution for that, but there are probably many different ways to handle it. Um, and also amortizing your payment, having sending larger payloads and trying to amortize your overhead um, can be a problem because nodes are moving around. So it's not like the, the Lightning Network where you know, maybe nodes go up and down, but they're more or less all on the internet. Um, here, nodes are coming in and out of range, so you may have to break down and start uh, more channels than you would in a, in a more internet-based system. So that means the overhead from, from doing setup and, and closing is going to be higher. Um, so some final thoughts. Um, I'll say it again. We're really focused on data, making sure that we broadcast uh, a good ratio of data to incentive. We want to we minimize the amount of incentive overhead and maximize the amount of data um, that's broadcast through the system. So that's our, our number one. Um, our number one thing. But we do think that, like I said, um, this starting with a low bandwidth um, messaging system is a foundation that you can build higher bandwidth applications on. But we think that the, the most used and, the, and the, the best way to demonstrate this is, is with a, a low bandwidth protocol and, and using uh, messages. Um, and I, I just wanted to also mention that when I look at this, look at these protocols, it's really signatures and public keys, which are the long pole in the tent. Those are the things that you can't, um, you can't infer, you can't compress. They've got to be sent uh, in whole, unless you know, yeah. So we at GoTenna are experts in scalable, mobile, ad hoc networks, uh, and we think this puts us in a good position to create an incentivized global messaging network, um, something that's both decentralized and scalable. And the, this Lot49 proposal that we're working on, um, its aim is to create an open source protocol, uh, open source incentivization protocol that we hope can lead to a, a global um, mobile meshing, mesh network that can really fill in the gaps in uh, communication throughout the world. And um, yeah. So we would like you to help us. You know, um, we would like to be able to take advantage of the full bag of tricks that we know um, cryptog cryptographers and um, specialists in decentralization and um, adversarial thinking experts can bring, can bring to the table here. So please um, think about this problem. Think about if you have you know, something in your bag of tricks that can help us, because we really like, would like to get your help. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. That was really interesting. I know I, I bought a couple of GoTennas uh, <laughs> a few months ago and tested it out. I just got my hands on an Android phone, so I was actually able to try TX Tenna. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, and we've got a couple of GoTennas also to give away as part of the raffle, so that's pretty awesome. Uh, we have some time for a, a few questions if anybody has anything. Yeah.
so what, what about the power draw on the devices that are around and in passive mode? Yeah, so the battery that comes with the Gotenna, for example, will last about a day. Um, but um, that's something that we actually are continuously improving with this Aspen Grove protocol. So successive versions, one of the, it doesn't just increase the number of hops, but we also are doing this in ways that, that minimize the battery usage. Uh, and that's essentially what you're paying for with your relay payments, is you're paying for somebody to draw down their battery to relay your message. So that's, that's an important part of it. Hi. Um, you have like a developer's perspective on like the benefits and detriments of your product, but what have your most loyal consumers like sentiments regarding pros and cons? Like what aspects do they enjoy the most or wish were better in some aspects? Uh, you mean people who just use the Gotenna generally? Yes. Well, I mean, this is, this is part of why we're looking at incentive networks is it's a great device if you've got somebody on the other end. So creating a larger bottom-up network of, it's, they call it the zero start problem. I think people use it now probably mostly with people they know, even though the, the device is capable of, of routing six, eight, you know, it's, you know, it's, it really can route over many people, people you don't even know. And I think creating that ubiquitous network is probably something people really want. And they, you know, it's, it's, it's our challenge with this incentive system. So I would say that's part of it. So you're trying to integrate more users into your platform. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's also one thing, too, to think about is that if I have one of these and I'm walking around my neighborhood, I might not turn it on. I may only turn it on when I want to phone home or, I wanna, or I'm at a concert and I want to find my buddy. But if I know I'm going to be incentivized to have it on, I know that I'll earn a few Satoshis to do it, just like why do people run lightning nodes? I mean, you're not going to get rich on the Satoshis, but it's, it's a little bit of incentive can actually have a big impact on people's uh, willingness to participate in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So that's a big part of it. And, all right, sorry, I'm going to jump in. Are you guys also <laughs> thinking about that for relay nodes? I know that uh, uh, one other thing that um, you promote is using, because you send them in two packs, right? So you, yeah. one you can carry with you, and one you can kind of leave home or at the office as Mm -hmm. uh, a stationary relay node. Um, are you, is that going into the incentive model? Because th those wouldn't really move. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, I think I, I think at this stage, I'm thinking more about people just leaving them in their window plugged in. You know, that would be something you might not do today because why would you? Um, but if you knew you could collect a few satoshis every day, then people might do that, and that also helps bridge the network. I mean, these are long. These are focused on long distance communication, so you don't need very many people participating as relays to actually create a very connected network. And then are you guys thinking of open sourcing the hardware at all? I know you have an SDK, but I don't know. Yeah, R Rodolfo uh, Novak likes to bash us about that. <laughs> um, we have an open SDK. Anybody can develop applications for Android, for iOS, for uh, Python. You can actually run it on a, on a Raspberry Pi. Um, but I mean, we're not open sourcing the hardware at this point. I guess you know that's always something that could be considered. Um, we're certainly open to the idea, but I mean, obviously, that's a big decision outside my pay grade. <laughs> Are there any more questions? One over there. Let's see if I can. Work that. And then I think this will be the last one. Uh, hey, whenever I talk to people about mesh networks, the very first question they ask me is, how do you get across the ocean? <laughs> well, satellites, <laughs> high frequency radio. So I think it's, you can't imagine a mesh, and that's, I, I've heard that concern as well. Um, when you imagine a mesh network, you can't just imagine a single device meshing. I think it's going to be multimodal, and it'll be the internet too. I mean, having the internet isn't something you want to just discard. It's just that you want to have alternatives so that if you're in Turkey and they turn off the internet, you know, maybe they won't turn it off because they know people have enough mesh devices that that would be fruitless. So yeah, so both gateways and other modalities, I think, is the answer to that question. Thanks. All right, let's give one more hand, uh, round of applause to Richard Myers.